Good morning, everybody. And um, yeah, my name is Luke Hines, and I'm going to be presenting uh, a relatively new project called Keyline. So let's get let's get into this. Let me get my clicker. Okay, so a quick personal introduction. Uh, I work at Red Hat in the CTO office. Uh, I've had, had background in security stuff for around, I guess it's getting close to 20 years now in many different capacities. Spent quite a bit of time working on tooling and uh, vulnerability handling and research. So my other gig is the product security committee for Kubernetes and I've, I've done various um, project team lead roles in different security groups as well, OpenStack, Open Daylight. And on a personal level, I, I live in the UK. It's quite a rural area. Um, generally, you'll find software engineers and farmers, and that's about it. And it's hard to tell the difference between the two quite often. And uh, I also, I, I, I'm a bit obsessed about running. I coach some kids, some 12-year-olds, and try to run a lot myself. I'm not very fast, but it's something that I, I enjoy. And it gets me out and about. So what is the problem? So I'm not really going to deep dive into this because you're a pretty smart audience. I'm guessing a lot of you probably know what TPMs are. You know about security trust very well, so I'm really not going to teach the choir how to sing, as they say. But we'll do a quick refresher so that everybody's on the same page. So essentially, software trust without a hardware means of protection typically resides in the memory or the disk. So we're talking about private keys, secrets, and so forth. And the problem with that is that you're then at the mercy of the lower levels of the stack. So effectively, we're talking a chain of trust here. You have your firmware, your bootloader, your kernel, your modules. Your, am I straying out the camera range? I'm sorry, I'll try to stick in this circle here. And all the way up until we've got our user land and our runtime, perhaps, you know, like a container runtime or virtual machines and, and so forth. And the problem here is if that a, a lower level of the stack is compromised, it's very difficult, the higher up the stack you are, it's very difficult to know about that, essentially. And you're at risk, but it's very difficult to establish that there has been a compromise. And this is even more of a case now that we have... Um, uh, loads such as containers and, and so forth, where they have to uh, trust the underlying host. So we have these things called trusted platform modules, and, and this is the key attribute that Keylime is built on top of. So we'll kind of do a quick overview of those. But as I say, there's probably people in the audience that know TPMs even better than I do. So I, I, I'm approaching them as a, an application developer. So a TPM is a specialized chip they're almost ubiquitous. They, you know, a lot of boards are coming with them already on. If not, they're pretty simple to retrofit. So that's um, at the bottom right, that's a picture I snapped of a, a Raspberry Pi 3 that I have. And on the GPIO board, you can see there's a, a TPM chip there. And it cost me about, I can't remember, about 20, 30 euros. So it's not expensive technology. And as I say, a lot of server providers already have them on the board. If not, they're pretty simple and cheap to buy and, and retrofit. And they're not only turning up in servers, they're in devices. Uh, they're used a lot in the automobile industry to ensure that nobody's tampered with your braking system and so forth. And, um, and, and so they're, they're a pretty common commodity to find. And essentially, the, the, the key attribute is they, they have a private key pair, okay? And the uh, sorry, they have an RSA key pair, and, and, and the private part is not accessible by software. It's only a, a special bus connection that can, that can access uh, operations to a key that is secluded within the chip. It's created at manufacture time. Now, the TPM itself, don't think of it as like a, a crypto accelerator. It's a very simple crypto engine, so it can... It can create keys, can sign artifacts, and it can do something that we call measure, which is take a cryptographic hash of a particular object. So it can hash critical sections of firmware, boot, um, 
some of you would know IMA, Integrity Measurement Architecture. So it can take measurements and it can use these extend operations to build a one-way hash function. And, and you can end up with a, a complete cryptographic replay of, for example, a boot. So that, the good thing is the hashes can be made public. So you can have a, a public counterpart of the private key and then using that, you can establish that this list of hashes that you're looking at, which represent a system state, they have um, not been tampered with because you have the public key which allows you to attest, essentially. And that is where you'll hear that word used quite a lot, attestation. And one of the, of several things, one of the things that we do in Keylime is we provide this means to remotely attest a certain part of your system. So let's go into what actually Keylime is. So originally the project was um, uh, the idea and a white paper was devised by uh, some folks at MIT. They have a security department there. They do stuff with the Department of Defense and protecting military systems and so forth. So there's a, a couple of people that worked on this and they came up with this idea of, of Keylime. And, uh, and, and from there, they started to prototype that. They wrote some code. And they came up with a, you know, a pretty good working system, a good prototype. And now, essentially, as I say, we provide a remote trust framework. So by framework, what I mean there is, with Keylime, uh, we're about trying to provide the means to the user to say what they wish to measure and then what actions they would like to take if the integrity of that measurement is compromised. So we're trying not to be too opinionated about how you should use Keylime. We're trying to make this a tool, a framework essentially, that you can then get to drive a particular use case that you would like based on the trust or non-trust of a system. Now, one of the good things from the, from the onset with the design, it is very scalable in nature. You'll see that when we start to look at the architecture. So when I was looking around for different solutions within the open source ecosystem, that's one of the things that I liked was they got a nice, simple, scalable architecture from the beginning as part of the key design. Uh, we support TPM 2.0, so that is the latest standard that is being actively developed. Uh, there is TPM 1.2, which we do also have the code that works and is supported. But going forward, we're not focusing on 1.2 because it is, it is common. You can find it still, but essentially a lot of the new chips that are all being released are based on TPM 2.0. So Keyline provides essentially this ability to remotely attest a SAIT as I said. So this is essentially based around measurements. So we get these measurements from different areas. So one of them is a measured boot. You would have heard perhaps the term used, a trusted boot. Okay, now using a particular project, a shim, uh, what we can do is we can, we can measure the bootloader, the grub, uh, kernel options. So for example, you, on the uh, a kernel command line, you can toggle SE Linux on and off, which is something that you wouldn't want somebody to change. Uh, the init RAMFS, the modules, and there's uh, the shim project, uh, what it will do is it will measure these and it will extend them into the TPM. So we can then query the TPM, we can make a TPM quote, and we can establish that nobody has changed any particular part of that boot cycle. The other thing we can do is we can measure secure boot. So we don't set up secure boot, we're not providing a secure boot solution but there's many attributes that are part of secure boot. There's the mock list, vendor DBX, there's various uh, parts that are, that are required for secure boot. And, and we can actually remotely attest that nobody's changed any of those. There's certain certificates and so forth. There is IMA, so we're getting into the runtime here. So this is where the system is booted and now it's running. And uh, integrity measurement architecture, it hashes objects when they're executed. It writes those hashes into a security FS. And then if IMA finds a TPM present, it will extend cryptographic hashes into the TPM that are based on the measurements that it's taking for runtime. It's part of the, the subsystem. So with this, we can, we can pick up um, 
executions. Uh, we can monitor SE Linux labels, files, and so forth. And then we have this other, like I said, we're trying not to do too much around features, but we have these sort of cases that people can take and, and get running with. And one of them is a, an encrypted payload. So essentially what we do is we, you as a user, you would have a payload. It could be some, uh, perhaps some TLS certificates that's required for a website, perhaps some config files that have database passwords and, and any sort of sensitive material essentially. And what we can do is we can, we can uh, measure whatever it is you wish to measure. So it could be the boot. Uh, we can measure the current runtime environment. And then if there is, uh, if, if we establish that you can trust that based on the cryptographic, sig, uh, cryptographic hashes that we're getting from the TPM and checking those against the public counterpart of the key that I described earlier, and we'll go a bit more into the different keys shortly, what you can then do is you can execute that payload on the remote machine. So you can essentially establish that nobody's tampered with that machine that you want to instantiate your sensitive workload on. Okay. If anybody's touched the machine, they've compromised with it somehow, then the payload is not made available. And this payload can be pushed over the air, or it could be something that's baked in the image. Um, you know, we have a, a, a script that executes that actually sort of uh, can do such things such as um, move it into a certain location or, or, or run certain commands. But none of this happens unless the trust is there. Okay, and then last of all, we have something called a revocation framework. So what this consists of is when a node fails its integrity, we can then kick off certain actions to take. So one of them is we integrate with a certificate authority. Um, we have Cloudflare SSL at the moment. We're not opinionated around which TA we use. It's something where we, we hope to have like an open plugin framework. Uh, we can also work with OpenSSL, so like a local CA. And what can happen is when a node fails, we can then revoke their certificate because there's a certain certificate authority that we bring the node into. So what could happen then is that node's TLS connections could break because you revoke the certificate, IPsec, IPsec connections would break down and so forth. And then we can also kick off what we call local actions. So if you have multiple nodes that you're monitoring and one of those fails, then you can tell the others to uh, to enact a local action. So that could be remove their key from authorized keys. I don't know, change a local firewall rule. Anything that you can think of, essentially. It's, it's kind of pretty much an open, scriptable framework. So we're going to, I've kind of glossed over these, but we're going to have a look at how these actually work. We'll go a little bit more deeper into the use cases. So to give you a high level view, I actually need to come back here to see the view a bit of, of our. I guess our architecture. So the, so the key things to, to, uh, to look at first, I should have a laser here. No, it doesn't really work too well. But to the left, this is uh, actually to, to your right, this is the Wild West. Okay? And then to your left, this is on premise. So this would be within your control, within your network, somewhere you trust essentially. Okay? And then again to the right, we have something called the agent. Now, this runs on the node that you're measuring, okay? And this agent has a very simple job. It just, requests, it just makes requests into the TPM using the uh, TPM software stack. So it's pretty simple. It makes a request to the TPM, and then it hands it back, okay? It doesn't deal with any secrets. Uh, we can go into this a bit later, but we, we don't care if somebody hacks this. Nothing is stored there. It's, it's pretty dumb. It just makes requests in the, to the TPM, and then sends back signed measurements. And if somebody was to tamper with those measurements, they would break the measurements. So the attack vector is, is pretty small here. Now, over to this side, we obviously have a bit more. So the first one is the verifier. Do you know, I've forgotten. I've actually got some bubbles here. So we communicate with the TPM, and we can do these local actions that we spoke about. And then we have the verifier. So this is tenant owned, as in the tenant being you, the user. And this checks the node system integrity. So this gets the measurements, and it verifies that the state is as it should be and, 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 is, and is expected to be. 
Uh, you have the register. So here we store the public keys, uh, certain public counterparts of the keys that we spoke about that are uh, embedded within the TPM chip itself. And there's a simple database where we uh, have the operational state of the node and its unique ID and so forth. We've got our revocation service, which we just spoke about. So this creates the certain actions that should happen when a node fails its integrity. And then last of all, we have the certificate authority integration. So as I say, at the moment, we work with Cloudflare, SSL, but we're making this to be open. So you could, you know, you could you'd effectively tie it into any sort of CA. Okay, so as I said, we have a, a kind of quite a friendly, widely distributable model. So we could go from a single site to a single node. We could go from a single night, uh, site to multiple nodes. Uh, multi-site to multi-node, so distributed data centers, you could have many verifiers and then many different devices and have the verifiers attest each other and so forth. And then uh, multiple verifiers can attest the same single node. So you could have a scenario where uh, you have like a, if we use cloud for example, you'd be, you could have a cloud consumer who wants to verify the node's trust before they instantiate their workload. And then you'd have Mr. Cloud Provider, who also owns the infrastructure and wants to make sure that it's of a, a good quality before they release it and, and, uh, and do whatever, you know, give it to another customer or so forth. So let's kind of go a little bit more into the ins and outs of the, the, the key operations and, and how this works. So the first thing is we need to set up our, our hardware route of trust, okay? We need to establish that we're actually talking to a real TPM, and then we need to set up the mechanism so that we can start to attest these measurements. So the first thing, actually let me come back. So on a TPM, you have an endorsement key and an attestation key. And what happens is the public counterparts of these are sent to the register, okay? So you have our attestation key pub, our endorsement key pub, and our ID. And the ID is nothing special. It doesn't have any cryptographic profit, uh, properties. It's just, a, it's just a unique ID string. Think of it like a UUID. Uh, what happens is our register, then uh, using the endorsement key pub, it encrypts a hash of the attestation key public key and it also includes a challenge. So we actually have a, a description of our different keys down here. You can see KE and it's uh, an AES256 key. And this is an inferior, in, excuse me, inferior challenge to certify the attestation key. So these are sent back. So we know that as this has the, uh, the private EK, it will be able to unwrap this challenge, prove that it knows and it will then respond with a HMAC of the KE and the ID, which is that UUID that we spoke about. And as that happens, we now have tied the attestation key to an EK identity, and we're now at the point where we can trust quotes that are signed with the AK. So that's our hardware root of trust. So the next part of that is, uh, this is something that uh, is quite unique it is, in fact, is unique to Keyline that we do. We have this key, devi key deviation protocol that we run. So you, the user, so you're this guy here, the Keyline tenant, and we provide a CLI application, or there's REST APIs to drive this. Uh, you'll create a key, which we call the bootstrap key, okay? And this key will be split. Now, when I say split, it's cryptographically split into two counterparts, okay? And we call these U and V. And first of all, what we do is we send the V part to the keyline verifier, along with some other data. We might have a whitelist, which is a set of golden hashes that we expect the IMA runtime state to, to, uh, to have a good comparison with. So we send the V counterpart up to the verifier, the verifier sends a nonce so that we can uh, uh, avoid replay tax, so forth. And then a TPM quote is sent back to the verifier. And this is signed by the attestation key. And we also include this other key called an NK key. And this is used to protect these split keys in transit. So all of this can happen over HTTP. We're effectively encrypting the 
key counterparts that we have uh, split over here, the U and the V. So this goes to the verifier, so it's a TPM quote, so somebody that doesn't know quotes, they're effectively the measurement list that can then be uh, taken by a party and used to attest a state using the public counterpart key. What happens then is the verifier will make a query into the register where we keep the public keys to establish that the AK is valid and we can trust it. And then from there, using this NK, this public NK, we'll encrypt it, the, we'll encrypt the V counterpart and we'll provide that to the key lime agent over here. So it now has half a key. Okay, so it still can't do much. Now the next part, and this is all part of a single operation. This isn't split into two stages, but I couldn't get it all on one slide. So, so effectively, this is the same transaction continuing across two slides. So the next part is the, eight, the, the tenant themselves, they also get a TPM quote, which is signed by the attestation key to prove identity. And they also get the agent's NK pub. And what they do is they then make a call into the register to again establish that the attestation can be trusted. Uh, if that checks out, then what it will do is it will send, it will encrypt using NK the U counterpart, and it will also send an encrypted payload if you're sending it over the air, that is to say. And what will then happen is, so it will encrypt U, send it to the node, uh, the payload, if we're sending it over the air, that would go. And then the key shares would be recombined, and the key now has the bootstrap key. And it has that key based on, like I say, this hardware cryptographic route of trust. So now that it has that key, it can use it to decrypt the payload. So we could have a tarball, for example. And then you'll have a, a script, which we call autorun.set.sh. And then that can then move files around and set up your web server and, you know, put them into your, uh, your kind of TLS directory and so forth. Wh whatever it is you want to do. I mean, it's, it's totally up to you. We're not opinionated. You can have anything you want in your payload and you can uh, carry out the operations that are applicable to your particular application. So, yeah, so I just to mention that the payload could be baked into an ISO or a QCOW2 or, or whatever image type it is that you have. And then the good thing then is you can distribute that, that uh, image with your secrets in there that are protected. And you'll know that those secrets won't be unlocked unless uh, the, the, uh, the machine passes its trust date. So now all of that's happened our kind of guy over here is having a cup of coffee, and we now move into the next stage, which is continuous remote attestation. So this is where we start to use IMA, Integrity Measurement Architecture. So effectively, we have this continuous polling that happens now. So a nonce comes in, and a TPM to quote is returned. Uh, the verifier attests the state, and then this continuously happens. So we're talking, it's very lightweight here. It's just a simple get request. And we're talking, a few, you know, we're talking a mere few bytes here. So, so uh, and this is something that's configurable. You can configure this polling to your, um, to your own requirements. And I have a single machine here, but this could be thousands of machines that are all putting requests into the verifier. And the verifier uses a non-blocking IO framework as well. So we've done some scale tests where we've had a few thousand virtual machines all requesting quotes into a single verifier. So I'm sure there's room for improvement, but it can handle quite a large, uh, uh, a large grouping of, of agents. <clears throat> so as I say, we're in this continuous measurement phase now. So one of the things that we would have sent earlier would be a whitelist. So a whitelist would be a list of hashes SHA-256 hashes in one column. In the next column, you would have a file. So you'd have a POSIX path to a file. So essentially, you've got the file, and then you've got its hash. File, then its hash. File, then its hash. And this would be a golden state. This would be something that you typically generate on an air gap machine. It would be a kind of a, a, a cryptographic state of what your, you expect your application to look like. 
Uh, IMA, as I said, populates the security FS list. So it also has a list of hashes and a POSIX path to, a, to an object. But the difference is it extends the cryptographic signing into the TPM. It extends the measurement, sorry, into the, into the TPM. And then key lima tests the, tr the trust state using IMA against the golden state, the white list. And we also, you can configure an IMA policy. So some folks might know IMA. You, this is where you delegate what it is you actually want to measure with an IMA. And then what happens? An integrity failure occurs. So somebody runs a script that's not part of the whitelist, or they toggle an SE Linux label, or they, they swap out a binary for a Trojanized binary, and it's called, and IMA intercepts, and, and a, an integrity failure occurs. So this is where we're going to get to the stage where we're going to start to take revocation actions, which we described earlier as well. So this is our revocation framework. And um, what we do here is uh, the, the nodes will all connect with a zero MQ, and we also have the existing connection to the verifier as well. The reason here is somebody could like kick the verifier out, so we need to make sure that the other nodes can let about, uh, they, they can let the others know about certain failed states and so forth. So what will happen is our node fails here. So we've got host C that has failed. First of all, the verifier will make a certificate revocation into the certificate authority to say that a particular device has failed its attestation. Okay. And then that could be part of a, you know, that CA. Uh, it could have a, a root a certificate that your kind of cluster then has it's all of its TLS certificates built on top of. So for a particular machine, you could effectively strip down its connections by revoking the certificate. <clears throat> the other thing we do is we send out a signed revocation event from the verifier. Okay? So this is a list of actions to take. And as I say, it's signed by the verifier. <clears throat> So let's have a look at some of the actions that we could take. I sort of already described these earlier. But the first one is the verifier sends out a signed revocation event. So we can make sure it's not somebody pretending to be a verifier. It's actually, you know, there's a, there's a sign in there. And uh, we send it out to the agents. And we tell them that um, uh, remove the failed node from authorized keys. It's a very simple example. But um, that's, that's a sort of just to give you an idea of what you could do. And then, of course, as I alluded to earlier, we make a certificate revocation, which invalidates all the TLS and IPsec connections and cuts off the failed node. The other thing, of course, is you could integrate this into an existing system. You might have an alerting system or, or um, an incident management solution. You make a, an API call or, or whatever it is, whatever it is that you, you want to do. So to come on to... Um, to move on in the interest of times, so a little bit more about the project and where we are at the moment because we're a young project. Uh, we, we've got a nice team that's building. Uh, we're, we're attracting developers organically, which is really nice. People are finding us. They're coming along. They're trying it out. They're getting interested. They're making patches. So there's a, a girl, Amy, recently joined us. She found us of her own accord. I think she found us through a good first issue. And she wants to revamp our UI, which is really nice. And, and so we're not kind of fixed to any particular vendor. We're a nice organic community. Uh, this is just like some metrics that are pulled from uh, GitHub by another tool. So as you can see, we've got increasing year-on-year -year commits. We're a young but established code base. They consider us a large development team. I'd like us to be a lot larger, but uh, you know, all in good time, hopefully. And uh, you can see the first commit was made by MIT in October 2016. And it says the recent one was an hour ago, but this was like last week or something. So um, one of the things, since I've got involved in my, the project myself, originally it was just um, some code on GitHub. Uh, we ported it from Python 2 to Python 3, because obviously time is ticking down on Python 2. Uh, we moved it from 1.2 to 2.0. So there was some sort of a key changes that we got into place and we've achieved those now. And we wanted to get it looking and smelling like a, a kind of a good open source project. So we have CI testing. So if somebody makes a pull request, uh, we, we instantiate a container which has a TPM emulator and then we run a series of functional tests to sort of mimic an attestation happening. 
And we also use uh, Coda City as well to sort of, you know, lint checks and so forth. Uh, we have some documentation. We need better documentation. I think every project, project could say that, but you know, we have the, a good framework there. And, uh, and we're starting to look at doing build testing as well. So we, one of the things with Keyline, we've had people interested from, of course, the, the, there's the, your kind of standard Linux distributions, but the IoT people and the Edge people are, are very interested in this. So I've had a few people approach me because uh, the, essentially with an IoT or an Edge device, it could be up in the ceiling there. So physically it's, well, that's not an easy place to access physically, but you get the idea, it's, it's not protected, it's not in a data center. So they have a lot of concerns around people kind of messing with uh, different interfaces and actually accessing a, an edge device or a, an IoT device. So uh, we meet weekly. Um, we have like a, a channel that's open 24-7 where we all hang out. So one of the things we wanted to do is when people come along and they try it, uh, you know, they get a big exception and something's broken and, or it just doesn't work or they don't understand it. We want to be really open and friendly for people. Do you see what I mean? So if people actually try our software, we're really going to try and support them, help them, get it working. There's no such thing as a stupid question. And just be a good open community that, that, that's welcoming really. So that's one of the key things that we've tried to, tried to have from the beginning. Um, so we, as I say, we meet once a week. Um, 1500 UTC, anybody is welcome, anybody is welcome. And we track all of our meetings as GitHub issues, so this allows us to reference pull requests and everything sort of ties in quite nicely, that, that works well for us. So what's coming next? Um, so we had the agent, and this is, remember, the part that runs on the remote machine that you're monitoring. That was um, originally developed in Python, and we're porting that to, to Rust, so I'm working on that at the moment. And uh, essentially, we've gone for Rust because performance, and uh, there's, you know, there's no garbage collection, and the security, memory safety, and thread safety, and, and, uh, and a strict compiler as well to help keep the technical debt down a bit. So that's a work in progress, and eventually the Python agent will then be depreciated. Uh, we're working on something that we're calling a, a VTPM support. So with a TPM, it's a hardware chip that's on a machine, okay? And it doesn't scale very well. It works very well within the context of being in a machine and a test in that machine. But if you have a virtual TPM, well, put it this way, a hardware TPM, it can't handle a significant load. It's better working with single operations. So some... Uh, the, uh, Somebody, Stefan Berger, has worked on some code for a VTPM. So a VTPM is great because you can, in, you can uh, instantiate it in a container or a virtual machine. But the problem is you're back to having your trust on disk and in memory. Okay. So we need to kind of cryptographically marry the VTPM's trust to the hardware TPM's trust. So this is something that um, was uh, created by uh, Nabil, uh, one of the guys from MIT. And he's working on this with some some interns from Boston University that are part of the Mass Open Proud project that they have there. And I'm not an expert on this, but effectively what they're going to do is they're going to pull all of the quotes together, build them into a Merkle tree, and then there'll be a wholesale passing of these quotes to the hardware TPM, which can attest them, and then they go back to the verifier, and then that will individually let the specific VTPMs and the person, sorry, that will let the person measuring those VTPMs know about their current state. So I wouldn't be able, if anybody collars me about more details about this, I'm, I'm following the work, but it's not work that I'm actually doing myself. I'm more working on the, co the core code base itself. But this will allow us mass scale, okay? So we can then have thousands of containers, not all trying to shoehorn them into working with one hardware TPM. And it extends the hardware crypto trust to the virtual TPM. So we're expecting, there's a, there's a prototype being developed at the moment. We're hoping we'll have something to show in perhaps three to four months. So um, interruptibility and feedback. So we love having different TPM vendors come along and try to get it working. And if it doesn't, we'll try to get it working for you. Uh, you know, we're very much into testing this out on different software environments, different platforms. Uh, generally, we're pretty much abstracted away from the hardware. So 
a lot of the time we're not really sort of heavily dependent on ARM or x86 or, or whatever. Uh, you know, we value feedback. That's the one thing. Tell us, guys, this isn't so useful. You should be focusing on this. This is what we need. That's the sort of stuff that we really value. So to round up, um, you know, we're looking for anybody to come and help here. Engineers, users, architects, documentation writers, people new to writing code, people old to writing code. You know, we're really not picky. We value any help that we can get. And uh, last of all, like I said, we're a young project. Uh, we have a responsible disclosure system in place where anybody can report anything that they'd seen. So I'd, so I'd ask, when you're asking questions, there's some experts here. There's something that you're, you're unsure about. Consider, you know, do we meet, maybe need to discuss this as being a potential uh, bug that we need to look at? So just, just be mindful of that because uh, we're, we're a new project. And with that, I can, how are we doing? Look at that, two minutes off, half past, I've done well. So we've got a, a little bit of time for some questions. But I'm here for the rest of the day if anybody wants to grab me as well. Uh, so on one of your slides, you mentioned you had a golden set of hash values. And I know on some operating systems, like Windows, that these hash values can be fairly unstable. They can change between multiple boots. And that Windows with the TCG introduced uh, the event log. Have you looked at that? Have you had good results, bad results? So that's a really good question because measurements has been the Achilles heel of TPM. OK. So uh, uh, with, with Keylight, there are certain things that are going to be more noisy and they're going to change their state more. Okay. So generally we get people focusing on the, the, the core parts of the system that should be monitored more than logs and so forth. So there's other approaches that we'd, we'd recommend there. You know, there's some interesting stuff happening with uh, trusted uh, TEs and so forth, execution environments. Uh, so, but on, on the question of measurements, so with the whitelist, um, you can reprovision a machine. So if you had an OS upgrade, you could send a new uh, list of measurements, OK? Uh, around how this would work with Windows, do forgive me. I'm, I should probably get more up to speed on what they're doing there. But, but one of the things that we're, we're excited about in Keyline when it comes to measurements is uh, there's a certain movement towards immutable operating systems, where it's very much a fixed state. And that makes measurements very easy then. So what we can then do is we can, uh, we've got a very static core OS to measure. And then we have the container where things are a bit more noisy and we can take our own approach there. So we're going to be looking at um, ways that we can make it a lot easier to source a measurement list and not have to be worried about this constant moving target. Because for the 10 odd years, or maybe more that TPM's been around, that's always been the, the challenge really, is, is, is how to manage these measurements. So, you know, Eureka, there is a, a good light at the end of the tunnel now. More questions? Hi, uh, thanks, very interesting. Um, Quick question about um, the actual core library that you're using to access the TPM. So there's uh, several possibilities that I'm aware of. There's a TSS from IBM and also some work from Intel. Are you using any of these to do the actual uh, data marshalling and unmarshalling, or have you um, implemented something on your own? Another really good question. I, I should have had that in my slides. So we're using what people refer to as the Intel uh, TPM software stack. So effectively, you have the, the, the resource manager, the TSS, and then the TPM2 command tool set. So, so we, we actually, we call through those. So, so we use that as our communication stack. Currently, I mean, it's not to say we're against using others. It's, it's just what we've landed on at present. But we're, we're trying to sort of focus more on building on top of that rather than you know, being uh, uh, too deeply entwined. Yeah. Good morning, and thank you for a wonderful presentation. 
The one thing I didn't follow is how is the um, bare metal machine provisioned and imaged in the first place so that you'll know what to expect as far as measurements are concerned? Yeah, so there, I mean, there are various bare metal provisioning systems that are around. Uh, there is, um, uh, for example, I know like OpenStack has one, Ironic, and Kubernetes has one. I'm sure Azure, you, you have your own bare metal provisioning framework. And, and for us, um, so there's two, the current approach is we, we remotely push the agent onto the machine. Okay, so we don't really care at what stage we measure because we're not going to stop a boot from happening, if you see what I mean. So, if, so we don't need to be really early to prevent a boot from happening. All we do is we take the very end resulting measurement and then we say to the app, we, we're there for the application to know that's a good environment, essentially. So, but having said that, we, we do want to look at seeing if we can be part of an early service startup within the TPM and do, uh, sorry, within the, the machine itself. But as to the real ins and outs of how we'll interplay with a, a bare metal provisioning system, we, we're yet to really eke out the, the best practices there. Yeah. Thank you so much. No worries. More questions? Yeah, so you've um, explained you can verify uh, the boot and um, integrity of the system uh, once it's originally booted. So what I was wondering is um, which problems can you not detect with this solution? So for example, if you have volatile changes in memory, can you like, verify the integrity of a running system? Uh, no, so, so we, we wouldn't be able to do that. We're not going to try and do everything, so we're, we're very much... Um, uh, we, we heavily harness IMA for runtime for verification. So, so you could think of us as being like a tripwire, but with a TPM rooted trust, essentially. And, and, uh, and the good thing about IMA, because it's in the uh, Linux subsystem, uh, it, will, it will create those measurements before execution as well. So, so there are actually other measures. There's, there's um, part of IMA is you have EVM, extended verification modules, which is a file label, and and that can make certain blocks and so forth. But we don't have the ability to, to really dig into the memory or, or, and we don't really plan to as well. I think it's a very valid area that needs addressing, but we're trying to sort of do one thing well rather than lots of things not so well. Okay. Sounds like a sane approach. Thanks. Other questions? Let's thank the speaker. Great. So, um, yeah.